Welcome to week six of Explore the Bible. Today we're continuing in the Gospel of Mark in a passage that probably is very familiar to many of you. So I want us to kind of see if we can't take a fresh look at it today, the passage out of Mark chapter eight. Before we dive into that passage, be sure and subscribe. If you haven't already, hit the little subscribe button, like, comment, questions, all of that. Put that in there. We'll answer those as as uh, fast and as well as we can. And then if you want to share it with other people, that's great too. We appreciate that. Of course, if you want to help support our ministry, you can go right here to give.exposedtochrist.com and you can support uh, the ministry that we have in teaching as well as the mission stuff that we do. All right, let's look at Mark chapter eight. We pick up um, kind of at the end of uh, a conversation that Jesus is having with the disciples. And so you need to go back and read all of chapter eight. Always say that, right? Read the context. You know, he's asked, who do people say that I am? And they've given him various answers. And then we start here. But you, he, he asked them, who do you say that I am? And that really is the question, isn't it? It really doesn't matter what everybody else has to say. The, the question is, what do you say? What's your answer to this question? And Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. Now, Mark gives the short version, Peter uh, gives this answer to Jesus on behalf of all the disciples. It appears they're all in agreement with it. Matthew gives the longer version of this. And he, that is Jesus, strictly warned them to tell no one about him. Now, this statement is the key statement in this whole deal, right? You are the Messiah. Um, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God we have in Matthew. This is the statement of the church. This is the statement of every believer. We believe that Jesus is the Messiah. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the anointed one, that he is the promised one, that he is the one who can take away the sins of the world. This is our belief, and this has not changed from the first time it was spoken by Peter till now. This is still true. The belief of the church is that Jesus is the Messiah. This is what we believe. If you have questions about that, you don't believe that, then you can't call yourself a Christian. I mean, you can be a nice person, you can be a good person, you can be a church attender, but eventually you're going to have to answer this question, who do you say that I am? And your answer must be, you are the Messiah. And if you don't answer that way, then you can't count yourself as a Christian. That's just the clear statement of it, okay? And so that's the answer that Peter gives. Jesus tells him to not tell anyone about him. He's, it's not time yet, right? He's going to, there'll come a time, but at this point, it's not time yet. And then he goes into these statements about what is going to happen and what must happen. And this is where the conversation really turns, right? Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and rise after three days. He's going to have to suffer. He's going to be rejected. He's going to be killed and rise, right? He spoke openly about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You love this? Right. He just spoke openly, but Peter, he didn't like that, right? But turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, and he said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Whew, there's so much here, right? I want to I want to point to you a word that I haven't yet marked, but this one, necessary. He began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer, be rejected, be killed. This is necessary. This must happen. It is mandated that Jesus go through these things. Mandated since before the beginning of time. Son of man slain before the foundation of the earth. This is necessary for the Messiah to be killed, to die on a cross. This is mandated. It must happen. You see, if Jesus doesn't die on the cross, then the penalty for our sin is paid by us and not by him. So we must endure that punishment and we will die. But because Jesus dies on the cross, then we have an opportunity to accept his death in our place, ask his forgiveness and commit our lives to him. But if he doesn't die on the cross, then we don't have that opportunity. He must die on the cross, and he dies not for what he has done. He dies for what we have done, right? 
that he must die for all of our sin. And think about it. It doesn't matter how small or how large our sin is, the Messiah must die for our sin. He dies for our murder. He dies for our white lies. He dies for our jealousy. He dies because we have been greedy, because we've coveted things that weren't ours, because we've been envious, because we have gossiped. He dies because of that, because of our sin. He must die. It is mandated that he must die. God the Father mandates that he must die die, right? It is necessary that he will suffer, be rejected, and be killed, and rise. We don't want to forget that, right? Peter didn't really catch all that, and it's so funny, right? Because here we have Peter, you are the Messiah, making the statement that defines what it means to be a follower of Christ. You are the Messiah, and then here say, no, 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 that's not what's going to happen, Jesus. You know, Peter's idea of what should happen, it's like, he says, you're the Messiah, you're, you're the anointed one, but you don't know what you're supposed to do. <laughs> it's kind of great, right, for Peter, suddenly. And this, this is the, the, um, the interesting thing about Peter, the ups and the downs of Peter, the highs and the lows of Peter. I mean, this is him, right? He goes from the very best to the very worst in a moment, because in this moment, right after um, he has been commended by Jesus. We see that in Matthew, right? Here, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He, you, don't, you don't speak. You don't know. Don't, don't give me that. This, these were the temptations that had come from the devil himself, right? The, go back and think about the temptations. This is it, right? Get behind me, Satan. And then he tells them, you are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. You're not wanting to do this God's way. You're wanting to do it man's way. Man's way is not. We would never, never do this. We would never give our child to die for the sins of a person that we didn't even know. We would never do that. But that is what God has done. God has given his son to die for the sins of those who never knew him on this earth, but to die for us, right? And our horrible things that we've done. This is what God does. This is how God does it. And Peter did not get that, obviously. Nobody would, right? Okay. Then calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, so now he calls everybody around, right? And he says, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? So this passage, you've probably heard this one too, right? If you want to follow me, deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You want to come after Jesus? You want to be a follower of Jesus? And here, remember, here we see Jesus begins to teach them about what is about to happen. He set his face. He's headed to Jerusalem. This is what's going to happen, right? And then he says, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. You take up your cross, and you follow me. This, this is the call to discipleship. This call to discipleship is the same today as it was then. He still calls us. If you want to be a follower of Jesus, you're going to have to deny yourself. Now, you may think about like St. Francis of Assisi, the, the famous monk who, who took a vow of poverty, who it said that when he was walking the streets, if he met someone whose clothes were worse than his, he would change clothes with that person, give him his clothes, and he would wear the worst clothes. He, he took a vow of poverty. But I don't think that's exactly what Jesus had in mind, although it's a laudable behavior. I'm not certain that that's what Jesus has in mind when he says, deny yourself. It is to take, well, to take human ways and pick up God's ways. It's to set aside what you want and to take what God wants. It is to set your own self-will behind and put God's will and God's desires primary, that these are now the only thing that matters. It is where Christ 
becomes ultimate in our lives and following him and knowing him and serving him is the greatest thing. And so whatever we have to do, whatever we have to leave behind, whatever he calls us to, we will follow him because we are denying ourselves and what we want in the life that we may think is going to be great. Because look what he says at the end. What what good does it do if you gain the whole world and yet you lose your life? What's the point of it if you get everything and yet you lose that which matters most? This is to deny yourself, take up your cross, take up the burden that you have to carry and follow. we got to move on. We're running out of time here. But what can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And then he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. This clearly is talking about the resurrection. Clearly, that's what it's talking about. That's the the power. And then Pentecost, right? The ascension and Pentecost, all of that is the, the, boy, that's the power of God at work right there in those three events, the resurrection, the ascension, and the day of Pentecost. We see this, right? But you see this challenge to not be ashamed. Don't be ashamed of me. The Son of Man, if you're ashamed of me in this world, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in glory. Be bold. Take your stand. Don't be ashamed. The Lord will not disappoint. He is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He is the anointed one. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Follow him. Give him all, and you will not be disappointed. Thanks for watching. I hope that's helped. Thanks for teaching. God bless you. Great passage. If you can get through half of it, you'll be doing really good, I think. All right? All right. Thanks for doing it. Subscribe if you haven't already. Like, comment, share with others. We'll see you next week.